Okay, we are in the middle of this letter. It's the Chitas that starts for the 30th of Tishrei. And again, a reminder that this letter is predicated on how we can deal with the person who is disrupting me during my davening. The previous two letters spoke so much about what a special time it is that I can uh, daven and be in this, this alignment with Hashem. And now I got some person who is deliberately attempting to disturb my opportunity for this closeness with Hashem. So we spent most of last week's lesson speaking about the divine power of speech and how it manifests and expresses and communicates the very depth and essence of the speaker to the listener. And now we're going to sort of replug that back into this very human ordeal of the person who's speaking and, dis and disturbing my relationship with Hashem. Vihine nefesh adam the yedua lekol she klua miyutzvidus. The nefesh of a person is, as is known to all, which we'll talk about that, is a composite of ten individual spheres. So again, hopefully these words are familiar to you. The idea of a sphera, like the English word of a sphere, a circle. So you got infinite, infinite, I don't know what that is, but spheres, they're little handles, little portals of entry, little discussable points within the infinite. And there are 10 that we identify, but they're not rigid like 10 numbers. They have fluidity to them. They interface with one another, especially in Kedusha, a surefire sign of something being of Kedusha is its willingness to cooperate with other spheres, each of them interplaying, in contrast to Klippa, where it's my way or the highway, where it's 10 separate lanes, silo effect. The difference between sand, where the, the grains are separate, and soil, where the grains work together and share their nutrients with the plant that shares its nutrients with the animal and the person and Hashem and so on. So the Tanya is now, again, turning to another characteristic that is really emphasized in Hasidus. And again, it's not that anybody disagrees with it. It's that Hasidus puts the extra emphasis on it. And it's summarized really in the first chapter of Pirkei Avos that says that it's not the discussion that is primary, but the deed. Or as we often summarize it, Hamaisa Hua Iker, the deed is the essential. So again, this is an oversimplification. There is one position in Torah that says that the deed is like busy work. And if really we were so disciplined and so sanctified, we could live only in the world of Torah study. But we're not so good at it. And we take breaks. So if we're going to take a break to go for a walk or eat a meal, we should also take a break to shake the lula. But essentially, that, that perspective suggests that the mitzvah actions are a disruption to my Torah study. And that could be supported by the statement in the Mishnah that Talmud Torah, the study of Torah, is the equal of them all. Then there's the other side of it, that the ultimate illustration or an effectuation of God's plan is in Maise B'poyo, actual deed, when we change the world. So again, this has always been a little bit of a tug of war. Do we see our human activities, like eating and sleeping and so on, as weaknesses? to be overcome, and wouldn't it be better if we could just not have to do all that stuff? Okay, once you have to do it, so there's a godly way of doing it. We eat kosher food, we make a bracha, etc. But innately, it's just a big nuisance. Or do we see, on the contrary, that this is the ultimate purpose which Hashem created the world, that we should illustrate the holiness that God resides in my eating, drinking, sleeping, living, and so forth, in a manner that is, in a certain sense, more profoundly demonstrative of God's infinity than even my davening and so forth, because that God is in my overtly godly behaviors is a little less revolutionary, a little less um, uh, uh, of a chiddush, of an innovation. That God is in the food and drink, now I've really demonstrated something meaningful and not intuitive. You know, that my mother thinks I'm uh, wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. But that a total stranger does, this is 
a more profound illustration. Yes. Didn't you? I feel like I was taught that um, that the people who didn't want to do those like daily mundane things and elevate them by eating and drinking and having children and having mortgages and making families went and, and they were so intensely spiritual and they prayed and they wanted to go to God. They didn't come back like the, the sons of um, uh, um, like uh Nadav and Avihu and the rabbi who wasn't it, isn't it the teaching like hasn't that question sort of been answered? Kind we of? would say so, but others would say, wouldn't it be nice if we could? But bummer that we can't. We're not allowed to. But will, is that our aspiration, or is that considered, you know, a weakness? Now within the realms of weaknesses, it's not such a bad weakness. It's better than the weakness for laziness and so on. But one perspective would say, right, we can't do that, but we'd like to. And you know, one day we'll get to. Gotcha. In the meantime, we can't. Or do we say that is an, is an impulse, but it's not the ultimate purpose. It's not even an aspiration. So the Alter Rebbe continues, and he says that we are comprised of the ten spheres, three of the intellect, Chabad, and seven of the character. And of course, all of these are ways in, in which we can understand Hashem because they come from the breath of God's mouth. So ultimately, there is no difference between my Chachma and my Bina or my Bina and my Chesed because in their essence, they're all the infinity of Hashem. It's more this concept that this is where it is expressed. It is expressed through Chachma. It is the infinity of Hashem expressed through Gevura, any of the spheres. Kedichsiv, like it says, v'yipach b'yapav, in the description of the distinctive aspect of the creation of human beings, again, different than every other creation which God created through statements, God said, let there be the trees and the, and the mountains and the sun and the stars, whereas with mankind, God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and he came alive. And that breath is undifferentiated, just like the human body is the product of the act of conception, whether it's the most sophisticated part of the body, like the brain, or the least sophisticated, like the fingernails. So too, the neshama in its essence is infinite. And then we see it through, remember the stencil, we see it, see it through the uh, individuation of the spheres. They call Makkah, nevertheless, Derech Prat, Chabad Shabbanav, Shein Dugma Lechabad Shibi Tzvidus, Hamachudus B'Shem Aveim. Still, while we acknowledge that, and again, it's like uh, if you have multiple children, which one do you love the most? It's ridiculous. You love them all the same in their essence, but you love them all in different ways based on the character as they present itself. So, too, each of the spheres in their essence are infinite. And they express themselves, again, imagining that stencil uh, analogy that we used, they express themselves through the particularisms of their sphera. So they, that is the spheroes, are models for us on this side of the ledger to see how they are expressed to us. Now, that means that they reflect that within Hashem's essence, and again, it's a spectrum, it's not rigid, it goes very gradually from the atzmis, the essence of Hashem, down to the way it's expressed to me, means that there is the conceptual idea in Hashem himself of Chachma, Bina, and Das, and all the spheres, and then as it expresses in me. So my Chachma is an opportunity for me to be connected with Hashem's Chachma. Just like you connect with other people through particularisms whether it's conversation, shared interests, shared activity. and it, that, But that is not the definition of your relationship with Hashem. It is the definition of your relationship with the bus driver. Your relationship is they drive the bus, you sit on the bus. They fix your teeth, your teeth get fixed. That's a very transactional, mercantile relationship. The intense relationship with Hashem, on the one hand, has to be infinite, but infinite is meaningless to me. So it is expressed through the spheres, 
meaning that Hashem squeezes himself into the spheroids so that we can be on this side and start with the spheroids and progress to the infinite. You may recall from the last couple of chapters of Lakutei Amarim, when the Alter Rebbe is searching for other ways to uh, stimulate a love for Hashem, one of them is by simply appreciating how much effort Hashem puts in, again, using human terms, to embed himself in concepts that are humanly appreciable. Hashem is infinite. What does it mean that Hashem wants us to return lost items? That Hashem wants us to not murder? That requires, again, using human terms, effort for Hashem to overcome his infinity. And it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, rigid, it's a spectrum. So there's the conceptual idea, the planning, etc., until it makes itself into something that we can understand. I know what lost items are. I know what it means to return lost items. And then hopefully that becomes a springboard for me to be connected with the infinity of Hashem. So as we say, God does the mitzvahs that he tells us to do. So what does it mean God returns lost items? So one level, we talk about how God returns things to us and so on. But then again, it eats more subtle and subtle level going sort of a reverse to the infinity of Hashem till we get to the concept of returning lost items, till we get to the concept of items and ownership, etc. The Midois, and again, remember the concept of Midois, is, excuse me, the um, six identifiable characteristics that we have, Chesed through uh, Yisoid, and these are a reflection and an insight into Hashem's Midois. Uh, uh, now we're getting back to our point at hand the power to speak, because remember, this is what we're ultimately getting to. How do I deal with this guy? Okay. That is comparable to the speech of Hashem. That's the beginning of, of Torah. God said, let there be. God said. Now, again, it's a human term, but it's a specific human term. That means there is conceptual ideas about speech that can be traced all the way back to the infinity of Hashem. And again, my term spectrum, there is the conceptual idea as it starts to express itself. And that's what Malchus is. Now, again, it's very hard idea for us. We don't have kings. I mean, we do in everything but government. Um, and it's the idea that the king is truly an exalted person who is devoted to the people so how can the people hope to have any relationship with the king? It's only through the king's speech, the expression that comes from the king. And that's what Shekhinah is. Shekhinah means the divine presence, and that's the significant word. The root of the word Shekhinah is to reside. A neighborhood is a Shekhinah. The place where God resides is the Mishkan. My next door neighbor is my Shekhin. He's what brings Hashem down here into this present world is when he speaks. That becomes the connecting point between me and Hashem. Okay. So when we speak words of Torah, we are now utilizing this gift of speech that Hashem has entrusted to us to be connected to the infinity level of speech. Meaning, just like in the two human beings, when I offer something of myself to another, and then they go and take it somewhere else, I feel betrayed. But when I offer it to them, and then they respond in kind, so that we become aligned as a result of this common shared the shared uh, experience, we now become unified. So Hashem invests Himself specifically through the mo the module of speech. When we respond by speaking words of Hashem, words of Torah. This stimulates a unity between us and Hashem. And to illustrate this point, we have a rule that the only way for us to fulfill the spoken mitzvahs, such as reciting the Shema, doing the after blessing, studying Torah, is to enunciate it. 
Because when we enunciate it, we engage our power of speech, and Hashem responds in kind with his power of speech. Now, unfortunately, our enemy has the same agenda. And if you recall from way back in the beginning of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe quotes King Solomon, who says, one opposite the other, and that the, the two, it's like a chess game. Both sides have the same pieces. And the pieces move with the same power and authority. And therefore, there are 10 spheroids in the negative, in the antagonistic, uh, uh, oppositional. And their mission is to conquer the 10 spheroids. They want to dominate my every thought, speech, and action. They want to dominate all of my chesed, all of my gavura. Because remember, the spheroids are tools. The spheroids are neither good nor bad. They are tools. Whoever is controlling the tool is manifesting its virtue or its uh, detriment. The, the spheres are tools, and they have the same tools. So we have a statement um, that man dominates man. What does that mean? So down here in this physical world, it's win or lose. It's zero sum gain. And internally, within ourselves, it's the same thing. At every moment, my chesed is either being directed towards godliness or it's being directed towards uh, selfishness. My intellect is either being directed towards godliness or it's directed towards selfishness. Now, selfishness doesn't mean it's evil. As I heard it summarized, the difference between the animal soul and the godly soul is the animal soul says, is this good for me? And the godly soul says, is this good? Is this good? Or is it good for me? Is this a good thing for me? Or is this simply good? Now, this quote from the Sefer HaGagulim, which is a Kabbalistic writing, is in, in conjunction with a statement in Kohelis. Kohelis is written by Shlomo HaMelech, and it's sort of like the end of his life when he's doing this reflection. And he says, I saw all this and I applied my heart to all the work that is done under the sun, a time that a man ruled over another man for his own harm. So Shlomo HaMelech is reflecting, and this is a common phrase that you find throughout the book of Koheles, about under the sun, under the sun, I, where one person battles another. Because under the sun, that means in creation, of course, what would be on top of the sun, there wouldn't be such a concept. Under the sun means within this human world, I win, you lose. Zero sum gain. There has to be this combativeness. Above the sun, meaning outside of this physical world, in the essence of Hashem, there can be cooperation. And as we spoke about on Shabbos, the world does not value kindness. Yeah, it plays homage to it and this sort of dress up where you know you help old ladies across the street and you and everybody thinks you're wonderful but ultimately we think nice guys finish last and being kind just means that you're being taken advantage of and we smile sweetly at it but we dismiss him as not uh not not significant we want the guy who's going to kill 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 that's what we want well torah doesn't see it that way this is what the Arizal explains that it's in, in this world, there's an opportunity where there's a dominion of klipa, which remember is the shell that smothers the Kedusha. But when things are gullis, I'm sorry, when things are in Geula, instead of might makes right, we make the argument that light makes right. And this is the distinctive quality that only the godly soul has. The quality that only the godly soul has is Mesiras Nefesh, is a total surrender of self-interest. There is no such thing as Mesira Snefesh of Klipa. Even if the guy says, give me liberty or give me death, it's still about me. You could make the argument here or there, but even when the fireman runs into the burning building, as he says, I'm doing my job. It's my responsibility. Maybe sometimes, again, even in Kedusha, it's rare that we touch it. But that's the infinite that has no counter in the Klipa world. Um, 
Soid galus hashchina b'teich haklipas. That's what it means that the shchina is trapped in klipa. Lachiyosim lashlitim is man hagolus during golus. Avahu l'ralei, but it's not to his benefit. This idea, I mean, the world is sort of learning this. You think about this even within communities and so, and the idea that I got to win and you got to lose and I have to put you out of business. It, we're starting to realize that that's not that that's not working. I mean, people who don't play nice wind up out of business. And people who are cooperative in their businesses, everybody winds up thriving. And this is why the nations dominate, because it's their home field advantage. They're able to squash the godly. In the story of Hanukkah, we describe the miracle that God delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak the many into the hands of the few, the wicked into the hands of the righteous. So the question is asked, we understand why it's a miracle for the few to defeat the many and the weak to defeat the mighty. But why is it miraculous that the righteous defeat the wicked? Why is that, why is that a miracle? And our answer is because the wicked always have an adventure in wartime because they don't care. So they have an advantage in wartime because they don't have any rules. And the righteous are at a tremendous disadvantage because they have an ethical obligation to conduct themselves appropriately, as we're seeing. So the, in Gullis, Klippa has got dominance. So we shouldn't be surprised that people sin. We should be incredibly impressed that people do mitzvahs. It's, it's amazing that people do mitzvahs because it's a world that is dominated by the, quote, bad guy. And it certainly seems... Like nice guys finish last. Even though this would require a tremendous explanation, and really this is the, the idea as why is it that uh, the world is dominated by the bad guys? Um, okay, I'm going to come back to one little interesting historical point here. It's not necessarily right now. Uh, that is the fact. Why it is this way is a, a whole separate discussion. The, the, the ultimate essence of it is, and again, we're seeing this in real time in such a profound way. The only way for Klippa to thrive is for it to suckle off the holiness of Kedusha. I mean, again, not to be too distracted, that's what's going on. They're all portraying themselves as virtuous. They're quoting this United Nations. The meaning, nobody comes out and says, we're evil and we're going to kill you. They stop doing that. They say, we're the righteous. What do you mean? We're the victims here. We're the good guys. To the world point that's got the world so spun upside down, it can't tell who's the good guys from the bad guys. Um, so why does that exist? It exists, as we know, um, Hashem allows it like the person who throws it over his shoulder it's not his direct desire but this is what gives us the opportunity for genuine free choice choice free of any persuasion and it's much what we're living through now so we got the whole world turned upside down so we can't even tell who the good guys are anymore and this is why, as we see, we got everything so twisted up that the antagonists to holiness are the ones thriving materially and enjoying uh, the, the, the pleasures of this world. Again, it's literally happening before our eyes right now. We can't even tell who the good guys are from the bad guys. Whereas the Yid and Yankim Vikinis Panim al Yenim, they derive nurture from Hashem's ultimate essence. Kamashikasov, like we say in the uh, priestly blessing, Yar Hashem Ponavelecha, Hashem should shine his face to us. Every single one, all the way up to his uh, his very essence. Now I alluded to this before. If you go back a couple of lines. The line reads about how the world is dominated by the nations. So the line reads, 
Hayusholt and Yisrael, they dominate over the, the Jewish people. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, above that. Uh, uh, that they give them uh, life and dominance in the time of Gullus, if, if you can find that line. Now, originally, this letter had another word, and that word was Ata, now, Ata with an ayin. That now, that's the case. But the Tsar did not like that, because he felt it was a direct offense to him. So they took out that word, and they made it more generic. But in the original letter, the Alter Rebbe, I don't know if he was specifically referring to what was going on in Russia in 17-whatever, but that was a, a, a censor from the Tsar. He took out the word Ata with an ayin, now, because it's not something that's specific to this particular time in history. And I don't know that the Alter Rebbe was attempting to limit it to that, but the Tsar did not like that idea. So what we have seen, again, and this is where we get to the point that's directly relevant to us, um, the 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 way Hashem set up the world is that uh, Klippa has access to Kedusha to fuel, and I'll use this word, to fund it's Klippa, it's evil. It has that access point. It can grab onto that. And the uh, manipulation of it winds up to the age-old question. Why do the evil seem to prosper and the, and the wicked seem to fail? Why does Hashem create it that way? Why does it seem that it's so much more fun to be wicked than it is to be prosperous, to be to be righteous. Why is that? And why did Hashem create things that he doesn't want us to use? Why does he make all this delicious stuff and then say, don't use it? And our ultimate answer is, and again, back of your mind, this is what we're going to be thinking about, this guy over here. Why does Hashem create this guy? Because it becomes an opportunity for us to strengthen ourselves and overcome it. That's where we're headed. So, all of the, uh, the the empirical evidence seems to suggest that it's more fun to play in the mud, that it's more fun to engage in all of the indulgences. And why does Hashem create them if he doesn't want us to do them? You know, that's the old thing. You know, well, why do you think Hashem made it if he doesn't want us to do it? Well, the answer is it becomes an opportunity for us to overcome ourselves, overcome it. And this is really the, the challenging point. That means that the infinity of Hashem is invested in that particular klipa that is this distraction over here. Now, now that we have laid this out in words, so it becomes accessible, and this level of truth. So this, and again, this is what I was uh, talking about earlier, and this is why I was sort of speak so excited about this part of the letter. We take this conceptual theoretical idea about Simsum Shalekib Pshutai. And like we ask Hashem, Yer Hashem Panav Elecha, God should shine his face to you, the specific person, not you in the many, but you, you know, down to the individual person, each neshama having its personalized relationship. And that Hashem in, allows himself to be hijacked by Klippa. Even though that klipa, again, we're living it right now, uses all the things that we thought we had. We thought we were the academics. We thought we had the corner on being per persecuted. We thought that we were the ones who stood up for everybody else and marched in Selma. And now what happened? All of that betrayed us. So sometimes we make the same mistake. and We push back and we say, oh, yeah? Well, don't you know that we are the most democratic and but that's playing their game. The only answer is Mesira Snefesh. The only answer is that it's the infinity of Hashem. If we're going to argue the Balfour Declaration, I'm sorry to go down this path, it's a little distracted, but hopefully it illustrates the point. Then they're going to argue, well, this, we're going to argue democracy, they're going to argue this. I mean, our only answer is this belongs to Hashem and he gave it to us. That's it. There's no counter to that. But if you're going to start with, you know, why are we not into debates? Because then it's, you're, you're conceding it's debatable. Once I concede it's debatable, even if I win, I lose. Because I've conceded that it's worth debating. That's the Masira Snappish point. Uh, so what should we do? See the Kedusha in this. And when we expose that, it goes away. 
Because when we think this has its own identity, we're doomed. When we realize that this is just Hashem, when we expose the godliness, it's gone. Yes, Cardi, you have to unmute so we can hear Well, you. yeah. Um, but here's the problem with I can't kind of get my head around is you can say this all day long, but if these people don't believe there's a God, what good does that us do us to say God gave it to us, it's ours? And they but they don't accept that basic premise so you know you're stuck I, I, I would say a few things i don't want to become overly consumed with this it's worth discussing for sure but we want to stick to the letter two things first of all we have to believe it. if we believe it the question well, yeah. isn't whether they believe it. the question is whether we believe it. it the question is again whether those people who were entrusted with the safety of eretz yisrael are going to start saying you know we have women's rights and arabs and the knesset well, true all true and all virtuous things but then you're in the Midois level and you have chesed, they have chesed. You have bura, they have bura. You know, we're persecuted, now where? You know, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. You know, we're persecuted, now we're persecuted. We march in Selma, queers for Palestine. Now you're in the quibbling. Right. That's it. B, everybody, I say everybody, understands that when you say the chosen land, no one thinks it's Canada. Nothing against Canada. Right. Right. Everyone knows where the chosen land is. Everyone knows what the Holy Land is. The whole world knows where the Holy Land is. No one thinks it's somewhere else. We believe it. We don't. We have to believe it. If we'll right. believe it, then we will be able to communicate. But as long as we're quibbling about the Balfour Declaration in 1948, so then our, it's it's point counterpoint. The, the uncounterable point is the essence of the infinity of Hashem. And that means even this guy is the essence of the infinity of Hashem. He doesn't even have a choice of what he's doing. He's there for me to overcome it. When I can take that infinity and manifest it into something like that, I am immune to it. But as long as I'm constantly trying to negotiate with him, I'm just fueling it, like every, every kid in the schoolyard. Well, as long as you respond to the bully, the bully keeps going. You don't respond, you rise above it, you negate him, right? What's the most disarming thing? Love me, hate me, but don't be indifferent to me. Indifference to it rises above it. That's the Mesiris Nefesh level. Okay, thank you. So that's this point. After these words and this truth, when we have this truth so rooted in our identity that it's like a reflex. Again, we talked about on Travis, you know, Pinchas, he doesn't have to think about it. It's automatic. It's so instinctual. It's so ingrained in our identity. And again, I don't know anything about the military, but this, you know, it's so trained that they don't have to think about it. It's immediate. It's automatic then this goes away. So now we respond to how do we overcome anger? So again, this is what was so exciting to me about this letter. We've taken the loftiest theological concept that is debated in the academies, and we've now brought it into the most tangible human experience, which is how do we overcome anger? We've taken the loftiest idea, we have expressed it in the most essential and we said, what is anger? Anger is idolatry. So it sounds like, you know, it's the worst thing we can say. The worst thing we can say is idolatry. So what do we say? We want to say anger is so bad, we say it's idolatry. Because it's the biggest thing we got. Well, it's much more than that. Anger is idolatry because it is uh, ascribing independent authority to that which is angering me. If I see it as Hashem, as godliness then I won't get angry. When I get angry, it's because I have ascribed independent authority to that behavior. And that is creating its own authority rather than seeing it purely as Hashem, creating it as an opportunity for me to overcome it. That's in worldly matters. Everything is in God's hands. Everything is in God's hands. Shoma Mel, Gamze Yavor. This too shall pass. Anger is a tool. It can be used properly. That's why we can find a use for anger. It can be applied in a godly manner. When I see, look, when I see some somebody about to uh, violate godliness. I can express myself, it's actually in this week's parsha. I can express myself with anger. 
In this week's Parsha, Moshe dispatches the Jews to take vengeance against the people of Midian, and they return with the captive women, and it says Moshe became angry with them. Well, you're not supposed to be angry. Well, anger is a tool. Is anger good or bad? It's a trick question. It's a tool. If it's used to stop people from sinning, it's it's valuable, like yelling. If I'm yelling at the kids, so he doesn't walk in the street, it's a valuable tool. Because Hashem gave him this opportunity to prevent a sin, and therefore, in that context, anger is uh, a, a value, and it's a useful tool. Okay, Beth, you had a question there? I do. So I was in Shul yesterday, and someone was talking behind me. And <laughs> so there I was trying to dive, and then there you were in my head, and then they were in my head, and I'm like, oh, look at this opportunity. It worked, <laughs> right. Hashem gave you that opportunity. But I have to say, it didn't feel very prayerfulish. Mm -hmm. All it felt like was I was thinking of a lot of things. It almost, <laughs> I'm like, oh. It's a I, process. I, I, <laughs> Ah, it's a process, you know. Again, gotcha. what did gotcha. I say? Uh, you know, if we we live a life and right. we don't solve our problems instantaneously, but at least we have an approach. Meaning, without this, that's it. All I can think about is how bad this guy is. But imagine, if instead of thinking about how bad this guy is, now this guy's not only talking; he's in, in my thoughts. He's One living minute. in my head. Now, all I'm thinking about is Hashem. I'm upset, Hashem. Why did you do this to me? But at least I realize that it's Hashem doing it to me. That's uh -huh. that highest level. Now, okay. the most Thank extreme you. illustration of this is the uh, the concept we have on Purim. People are familiar with the rule. It doesn't say this in the Tanya here, but I think it helps with this idea. It says that on Purim, one is obligated to become so intoxicated that they cannot distinguish between blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman, or bitter is Haman. So commonly, this was always understood as sort of a half uh, lighthearted way that you should be so celebratory. But the Chassidus takes this very, very seriously, extraordinarily. Here, Why is this a, 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 an aspiration that I shouldn't be able to tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman? Is not our entire mission in this world to distinguish between the good and the bad? We say we begin the week with Havdalah, Lahavdil, Ben Kedush, Lachol, to separate between. Why would we make it an aspiration to say that there's no difference between Mordechai and Haman? And of all days on Purim. On Purim, we're celebrating the downfall of Haman and the rise of Mordechai. And so this explains. Very difficult thing to absorb. And that's why you have to be drunk. You can't figure this out. It's not rational. Haman is just as much an agent of Hashem as Mordechai. Now, there's no way. That makes no sense. Right. That's why you have to be drunk. You have to rise above Seichel. Even Haman is in the service of Hashem. That makes no sense, right? It makes no sense. That's why only on Purim, when we reach this level, that, like the word Purim, lottery, it's beyond logic. It is illogical. It makes no sense. How could you even suggest such a thing? You can't, except on Purim, except when you're drunk. You get drunk, and again, drunk doesn't mean it comes out of liquor. It means you rise to such a level, like a drunk person who's not operating logically, and say, you know what? Haman serves Hashem, just like Mordechai serves Hashem. I don't understand it. makes no sense to me. Now imagine if we can see this guy is serving Hashem or whatever nuisance comes my way, God forbid, that we can see this all as an opportunity to rise above. Wow. Think not only that it's true, it's also a very, a lot less uh, high blood pressure, a lot less frustration, a lot less inner turmoil. So now, and again, here's where I get animated. So we've taken the loftiest concept that all of Hasidus is built on, Tzimtzum Shalei Kipshutai, and we've brought it down into the most mundane concepts and practices of this and every nuisance that may or may not, God forbid, come my way to be able to see the infinity of Hashem in all of those circumstances. And again, it's not something that, oh, right, now we turned it on, I told you. Just like you don't learn to drive after one driving lesson or knit after one knitting lesson. But at least you have a path to follow. Ah, however, 
This idea of getting angry, which we have now el- uh, uh, illustrated from this week's happens to be this week's parsha, that anger is a useful tool through which you can prevent. I mean, God forbid, a kid's about to walk in the street. We don't say, "Excuse me." We, like, we scream at that kid. We scream with such intensity that he gets so scared he starts crying. But that's better than putting his hand on the stove. So, so this seems to suggest that anger is good. I should scream at this guy. I should turn around and scream at him because that, well, <laughs> this is where you have to assess the situation. That value is only when I have the capacity to stop him from his misbehavior. But what if I don't have that ability to stop him? Now I have some person who worships piles of rocks. That's what's important to them. And they are deliberately attempting, they're not just chit-chatting about their own conversation. They are deliberately attempting to disrupt my davening. They're bad. They're real bad. My being angry is not going to stop him. It's going to encourage him. The more I yell at him, the more he's going to be encouraged to keep doing this. Why did God do this to me? So this frustration of why did God do this to me, the only answer could be, it's not for me to stop him because I can't stop him. It's for me to become more resolute. There's some famous guy said, they tried to bury us and they found that we were seeds. The more we become oppressed, the more we respond with that intensity. This becomes my opportunity to overcome it. Uh, the kavana gedoyla, greater kavana kolkach, actually yishma debura yodiglum, to like get to the point that I don't even hear it. Because once I engage, I have lost. Because I have validated his existence. And again, not just like we tell every kid, it's true, that the bully just wants your attention and so on. Again, here the Alter Rebbe has added this the- theology to it. If I think that this guy has independent authority, that Haman has independent authority, then I am validating his pile, the galulim that they worship, instead of seeing that he comes from Hashem. I, if I can see the infinite godliness, then this guy doesn't exist. Then Haman is just like Mordecai. I negate Haman's Hamanness by seeing the infinity of Hashem contained within him. If I can do that, I negate his existence. Not only that, he won't, he'll stop doing it, and they're just trying to get you to respond. All the things that every parent teaches their child about not responding to bullies and so on, which is all true. But now we have a theological understanding of what's going on. Because he worships the value and the, the stature of self, the thing. And we need to expose the no thing. And by exposing the no thing, we eliminate the thing. If we validate the thing, then that is avoidus gilulim, the worship of piles of rocks. Because where do all things wind up? With Blackberry and Palm Pilot, they wind up with the Kodak camera. They wind up in the garbage. Yes. Yes, no, maybe so. Yeah, Beth, you wanted to say something? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see the um the the godliness in whoever launched that drone or that that rocket yesterday that killed the the twelve kids playing soccer? How do you see the godliness in that person? We see that everything ultimately comes from Hashem. I mean, uh, right? We're in Gullah, so right now it doesn't look that way, but the, we know that that's it. It all comes from Hashem. You have to be drunk. It's not something I can logically explain to you. So how do I do this? So, okay, now the guy's talking, and I say, I'm not going to listen to him. I'm not going to get annoyed at him. I'm going to use this to steal myself and really fixate on my davening. I start to think, it, like the guy pulls up next to you on the road and he's got that music banging. All right. Poor guy. He's trapped in that car with that loud music. <laughs> Too bad he doesn't know how to turn it off. Meaning, I start thinking about Rachmanis on the Neshama. 
this poor neshama is trapped in this guf. God forbid you see a child who's in it. You say, this poor child is trapped with these evil parents. My neshama is also trapped within me. There is a somewhat similar uh, strategy that I start thinking about where can I find some characteristic of this within myself? Where do I find myself overvalidating my humanity to the detriment of my neshama? And if I can start to see that within myself, I can start to see the godliness that is there. I mean, this is that idea from the forest comes the wood that to makes the handle to chop, to, to, to hold the ax to chop down the tree. So we chop down trees to make handles to chop down, to, to axes to chop down trees. This, not only I go, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. Something even more profound is I turn it around. Now, this guy is going to do this forever. He's never going to stop until Mashiach comes. I am i don't have, again, the, the scenario here is I have no way of stopping him from this. But I do ha have a way of overcoming the anger. You know, it's pain is involuntary. Suffering is voluntary. Um, now, what's happening? This poor neshama is trapped in this body, and it's utilizing it to be talking and so on. Uh, and it is using it, the power of speech, which is so profound, the ability to express the essence of myself, the manner in which Hashem created the whole world, is now being uh, tortured and hijacked to disrupt davening. The beauty of speech has a parallel in the nastiness. You know, words can inspire, words can deflate, words can uplift, and words can denigrate. God uses the power of speech to create the world, and he entrusts that power of speech to us as well. Uh, this goes back to that quote from Kohelas, that under the sun, man dominates man. It's a competitive, I win, you lose kind of world. And it's to everybody's detriment. Because now what happens? This guy, this talking guy, makes me daven that much better. To such a point that I become so fixated that I don't even hear this guy anymore. Now, the Alter Rebbe is now going to return to an analysis because this whole letter began, you know, whoa, those weeks ago, based on a statement that is recorded in the Tzavos Rivash, which is a book compiled by students of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov did not write any books. Remember, Tanya is the first written book of Hasidus. These were students who recorded the Baal Shem Tov's works. Now, they're not just making it up, but it could be somewhat imperfect. So the author Rebbe says, this, that the malachit, the collector of these writings, writes the word, and we're going to see the specific word, which the author Rebbe is going to talk about, is because he didn't properly capture the message of the Baal Shem Tov. He didn't capture the words precisely. Why? Because the Baal Shem Tov conversed in Yiddish. And it got a little bit lost in translation. And as we know, when you translate something, you sort of close down the meaning. Whereas in the original meaning, there's often a nuance and a subtlety. So when we want to do a deep dive analysis of the terms, it's not fair, use that word, it's not accurate, it's not responsible, to use a translation of somebody's recollection. So we got to get into the real precise wording. Ratzalim, this means, he meant to say, Nislapsha. Behind the Bechin is Golis, Vizel, Befrat, Imu, Evdigalulit. So there's two words here. There's the word um, of Nislabesh, that it becomes invested. And then there's another word that it be, that it resides. Now, this is not only, you know, a sort of gotcha for the grammar and the punctuation and the wording and it's it's based on a conceptual distinction as to the presence of Hashem, again, Simpson Shalekib Shutai, in this physical world, as the Alter Rebbe now elaborates. 
Shaw's who bechin is golus beyoser. That at that when that happens, when the godly soul that is invested in this yapper is now being further abused by having it used to uh, distract me and annoy me during my davening, in that environment, in that circumstance, in that uh, uh, scenario, the godliness is being further and further buried. Um, and you might challenge and say, well, you're saying the Shechina, God is in Gullus. Well, it's not all. It's this guy. It's this guy. His God is in Gullus. His Shechina. But we find this, just like Avram Avinu. Uh, we'll see here. The Eshkan Shafilu Malach Nivra Nikra B'Shem Hashem, B'Pash Zavira, Lathia Ramban, Kamer Shekas V'Tikra Shem Hashem, Hadev Reila, Chuluk, Hai Gad Natuva. As the Ramban explains, that in the story of the three angels who came to visit Avraham after his bris milah, he refers to them by Hashem's name, Adoni. Now Rashi says, Rashi says that it's just this term, like my my master, sir. It's just, but the Ramban says no, that that uh, uh, Abraham Avinu is calling them God. Why is he calling them God? Because he's in a messenger of God. He's an expression of God. I don't know if this is a perfect analogy. It doesn't say it here in Natanya, but another way of seeing it is in classic literature. See, aren't you impressed? I know classic literature. They refer to the king of the country by the country. They call the king of Denmark, Denmark, because he is the embodiment of the country. So the angel can be called God's name because he's there on a mission from God. And therefore, it is appropriate to refer to him by God's name. Now, the author Rebbe is going to say, this is really a quibbling about it, but it's born of a conceptual distinction of Simsum Shalek Ipshuta, as we'll see. Kumidumali Shitvis Flasam Ain Mitsa Diktu Kalashan, Elmi Ikir Inyan Islapshis Ashina Biklipais, Shain Lehem Amuna Bamashakosava Rizal Basepra Gagulim, Shimyortu Lechalik Ben Klipas Aruchnim, Lady Galulim, Agashmiim, Ain the Hagashmi Kafar Aritz, Afo Pikain, Mislabeshus by Malchus the Malchus the Asir, Basekha Malchus the Asir Kulukana. The real issue here is that they do not accept the teaching of the Arizal, it's in the Sefer HaGigulim, which is that God is invested in this physical world, and there's nothing more physical than the dirt of the earth, and yet the, the, that contains within it the infinity of Hashem that traces itself all the way back. It's from the Malchus of this physical world through all of the higher spheres to the Malchus of the higher world to all the higher spheres to the highest world, higher, 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 all the way back to Atmos. And that's really the point that bothers them. Not just the quibbling about this or that, it is about the infinity of Hashem invested in this physical world. And if you'll argue, how could these idol worshippers, whose souls are the process of total tumma, how could they contain within them the infinity of Hashem? So the Arizal writes, that they are the product of the union of Zun, uh, of the, the Midas and, and Malchus. Nimsha Ruchni That their origin is, in fact, Ruchnius. And the author ever says, Look, you don't understand this. He doesn't, you don't get it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. This is in the Ariza. You know, you don't like what I think. I'm basing it on Shulchan Aruch. You don't like me? Go yell at him. Meaning, if I can find you a basis for it, you, then your argument is not with the Baal Shem Tev, Your argument is with the Arizal. So this is a common Torah style. You know, you don't like what I said, but I can show you. Oh, okay. Him, I, what does it say then? Oh, it says it in Rashi. Okay. Oh, it says it in the Ramam. Okay. Even if I disagree, but it's not. It's based on a legitimate source material. Um al yechasheni. Look what the says here, something incredible. Look what he says here. And do not assume, those who hear, that I understand exactly what the Arizal is saying. That the infinity of Hashem lives in this guy. That the infinity of Hashem lives in Haman. Again, understand. You got to be drunk. You can't, don't think that I can explain it to you. You got to be drunk. It's higher than logic. Don't think I can understand it. Um, 
שהבנתי מגשמיוס, להפשיט אותם מגשמיוס, כי לא באסי רק לפרש דרבי אבו שם טוב זל ותלמידה ופי קבל זריזה. That I can somehow strip it down to its uh, most uh, uh, tangible interpretation. That's not my job. My job is to explain what the Arizal says. This is what he says. I don't understand it. How could I understand that Haman uh, serves Hashem like Mordechai serves Hashem? I can't. But Haman serves Hashem. Like, that's what it says in the Gemara. There's no difference. That's it. I don't understand it. It doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> And again, this idea, it's not from the Kabbalah, from the hidden things from Hashem. This is what we can see, to believe what it says in the Pasuk. And the Pasuk says, in Yirmiyo, The heavens and the earth, I fill them. I fill them. I don't know what it means. Click here for more info. That's not my purpose. The Pusik says, I fill them, I fill them. Hashem, I fill the world. I'm in Muhammad, I'm in the 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 talker, the yapper, I'm in that, I am, I don't know, it is. Uh, you cannot strip it away from its literal meaning. This is an absolute premise for all the Jewish people. And we follow along with this. Every Jew understands it. It's not because I understand it. This is based on how I understand it and so on. We want to understand it, but it, the fact that I can't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. Asher hula mailem yaseichel adin ketz leide eichu ma mole kola aretz. This is the idea that we know. We know that it is, even if I don't know what it is, that Hashem fills all the world. That's the fact. What that means, I don't know. I don't have any way to do it. I don't know. It just simply is that way. Um, this is that, that sort of uh, innovation to analyze what this really means. And I can't really explain it to you. Look what Al-Dravah says. I can't really explain it to you. This is what the, it says straight up. This is that idea that he makes it known to us, that Hashem is even in idolatry. It's shocking. It doesn't make any sense. How could it possibly be? I don't know. It's not something I can explain to you in words, it's not something I can write to you in a letter that's missing the human interface and interaction. And again, as we are experiencing, because we start thinking about circumstances, we say, how could that be godly? But again, <laughs> the alternative is that God isn't there. And if God isn't there, we're attributing independent significance to it. No thing can exist without the infinity of Hashem. So if I say God is not there, I'm saying there's some other force at work. This can only be done face to face, mouth to ear, like those who seek Hashem. So I can't just, you know, you email me that, that, that this is a whole transformation to incorporate or at least be able to tolerate this idea, if not understand it. So here again, you see one example with something that seems shocking, but it's got ultimately a way that we can understand and a way that we can comprehend it, even though it seems impossible. Please do not ask me or expect that I can just explain this to you. You know, would you email me this? It's not going to work. It's a very heavy, and it's not possible to explain something so subtle in words. Rakim Tirzu, if you want, send me some designated representatives of your community. And I'll talk with them face to face, interact back and forth. 
hatifi will be together with our mouth. May it be that the words of my mouth are desirous, which you may recognize as part of the davening. Hopefully I can speak to them personally and explain it in that manner. The end.